launch was very good, uh, which means that the post-launch session is a challenge. <laughs> but I will try to engage you. Uh, okay, so um, in the modern sessions, it is a very overarching uh, you know, sessions, uh, very challenging, interesting discussions. Uh, what I plan to do in this session is uh, go to a little bit more specific example of what I call policy advocacy, uh, which uh, can begin at a regional level, like in India, but then have global repercussions and global applications, and then I will listen to you what you think about that. So, uh, CSIR starts, so therefore, the current focus uh, we have recently repositioned our institute. Uh, we have now a great urging to make connection and do translational research, which basically means that uh, research, while it may be you know, going on forever, uh, we stop every now and then and translate something from the research lab to the uh, society or to the industry on two hands. So this is something I am talking about. I won't talk about meta policy today, which we have begun, but I am talking about uh, applied policy research, which is a proof of concept. And, uh, and that leads to policy advocacy. And this is a regional innovation system with possible global impact. So what is the uh, policy advocacy we are talking about? The example I have taken is basically the climate change mitigation, uh, in particular reducing the atmospheric carbon uh, through certain uh, system, which is highly uh, found to characterization. Uh, but uh, these two, of course, already know the big problem of uh, CO2, and in particular, the clear evidence from IPCC. So therefore, the question is that how do we solve this CO2 problem? Uh, and the answer we are trying to give that there is a better bioengineering solution, which is both sustainable, non-disruptive, and supportive. And then we would like to convert it into a policy advocacy, and then say, a good legislature which can be put to the government to say this legislature is needed and is uh, implemented. That is basically the strategy. This, of course, you know, the cumulative effect of CO2. I don't need to show this. Uh, so, but, uh, what is called sequestration, just for those who might have come in late, it is a mitigation solution to reduce or counter the CO2 load in the atmosphere. Uh, how do you do that? There may be many uh, mechanisms or agents through which CO2 from the atmosphere can be absorbed naturally, but obviously they are not being able to keep up with the build up in the atmosphere because of emissions from different regions and becomes uh, a global problem because the emission in one region eventually gets distributed throughout the globe through the atmospheric circulation. So problem is global. Can we have a global solution as well or one of the solutions? So how do you do implement such a sequestration? It needs to be sustainable uh, in terms of long term and self-supporting if possible. It should be cost effective. It should be non-disruptive because if we require very large changes in terms of policy or legislation or economics, it becomes essentially a non-starter, especially in country diverse like India. Uh, it should be efficient. It should lead to significant sequestration at fairly low cost. It should be supported so that it can lead to other benefits, not just, uh, uh, which is a desirable thing but not mandatory. And it should be effective and implementable, and hopefully can be globally implemented, at least part of the globe. So there are many options for carbon sequestration. You can have iron fertilization, which was a big uh, talk at one time, uh, but it turned out that not really. Uh, you know, doable at the moment. Uh, maybe you end up emitting more in taking around the ship than the sequestered from through the process. Uh, uh, the other one, of course, underground storage was also advocated uh, in Canada, but I think in Canada it was received opposition as well. They called it buried trouble in paper in science in 2012. Mm -hmm. Looks like that land based, vegetation based is very promising and less explored. So this is our advocacy we want to meet. So uh, now, what is the R&D basis for this? This is the translation, but for that we need to have an R&D basis, credentials. So this was what was done through field experiment and then published in Economy for Sustainable Development. That is a requirement we have that before we can put it something up, it must have a scientific credential here, 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 etc. 
Now, just to tell you very briefly what the vertebra is, it's a basically a tropical grass, perennial, for about one year life cycle. And uh, it's called a tree grass. It's called a tree grass because it has a very deep, long, large root system. So, although it's a grass perennial, its root system is, can store a lot of carbon. And it is a very, very tolerant. It is tolerant to salinity and prolonged water log condition as well as and also strikes in drought condition. So perfect for India. <laughs> you have all the problems here and it still grows there and it does grow there, I think. So therefore, if you could have this, uh, typically, if you have a 500 square meter area, it will sequester 1,000 kilogram of carbon in a year. So that's typically the benchmark. So you need, to, you cannot easily calculate how many uh, such units are required uh, so that you will have a significant amount of carbon sequestered in a, in a year. Of course, it has to be done year after year, but these are only, these also add to the environment, so this is a typical experimental field, and it's a it's more, it's a green uh, growth, so nobody actually minds, and it is aromatic, so nobody actually people are coming, so that's not a problem. So in terms of efficiency, uh, we have to first carry out a very large study to show that it is the sort of you know, the best choice or it is the optimum choice. So we picked up several varieties and so on and showed that it is in fact uh, it doesn't saturate even after a year and it is the highest carbon sequester which is on the y-axis so it's a good candidate. Uh, in terms of dry land and we can skip this for a moment we did a number of studies like that uh, different uh, species and also with trees, with uh, arable cropping systems, with lemongrass, with a lot of them, finally to say and uh, receive uh, international peer acceptance that yes, that you is a good bioengineering solution for this. Okay, in terms of sustainability, because it is an aromatic and medicinal plant, you can grow it and you can actually exploit its, uh, uh, for example, the oil, and if you down, calculate in terms of essential oil, uh, you can have a significant net income, which can be therefore converted into a transport uh, supportive system, take an economically supportive system. In addition, we have various other products coming out of it, which can support uh, the industries and you know, local population through various products and services. Uh, but it also has an uh, international market of $200 billion a year. It is not disruptive because when you do this, you do not have to convert uh, agricultural fields that are already uh, functional to medical fields. You use areas or lands which are not actually otherwise usable and uh, do this. And this has been experimented at um, a number of places. We have shown that. So why do we call it supportive? Uh, we call it supportive. Uh, because it also helps, in particular it has a great uh, water purifying capacity and the government is now planning to plant them along the uh, Ganges and the Yamuna River so that uh, you know, they will do also water purification in the process. They are very great at uh, you know, land holding uh, so that uh, their roads and all that become a little bit less resilient to landslides and things like that. Uh, as I said, it improves water quality. Uh, in terms of effectiveness, uh, you have to uh, show that uh, our area, which one gives you more, uh, this table is clumsy, I think, crowded, but you can see something that is in bold, which is basically tells you it's about 10 times or at least 5 times more than uh, comparable plantations. And uh, so this is something also helps you you can calculate in terms of the percentage of emission in terms of India and world. What would happen if you used the uh, available land, available wasteland in India to convert into vertical plantation? It tells you that you could take care of 46 percentage of the current in, uh, Indian emission and about 2.4 percent of the world emission. Uh, so there is some hope in that. Uh, what you plan to do is that. Uh, we are now trying to show that it is not enough, that it is a, as an SNT solution, it must still be okay, but as a, an implementable uh, solution, you still need to show that it can actually be done, let us say, in India. 
So what we have done is that we have taken up about uh, four, 8,000 square meter of area within the capital of Delhi and planted this very, very hard. And we have to have, somebody mentioned about uh, measurable targets and uh, I think, uh, yeah. uh, so, so what is a measurable target? Uh, and how do you really see that uh, it has been effective? Well, in date of 2015 days of CO2 emission, projected to 2016 or 17 because of the addition of new cars and so on, what would be the CO2 emission level? concentration, and then you say how much it has been because of this intervention. So that ratio tells you whether it has been somewhat effective or not. But there are also field experiments and laboratory experiments which tells you, which we do on a regular basis, how much carbon is sequestered per plant or per dry biomass, and you say, okay, 500 square meters we sequester 1,000 kilograms of carbon in a year, therefore this is estimated in a high but we need to also do, I mean, one thing that, as I said, our uh, objective is to make it an integrated solution. For that, you have to do an integrated carbon footprint estimate. Uh, if you, it is not enough to say you have done sequester, but what happens in the TH, will it come out, how much will it come out, and you, need, you are transporting it using a tractor to some factory to extract the oil, how much emission is taking place during that process, and what is the net carbon footprint. So it is a net carbon footprint of any process that really matters. So those we have done, and in fact there was a very interesting study by Ravi Gates in 2013, and he said if you plant 4,000 billion vertebral plants all over the world, then it can mitigate the uh, access to the problem of the world as a whole. Now 4,000 billion vertebral plants may sound like a very big number, but actually it's not. It's not really that big, um, because we are talking about the world as a whole. So but then, can we sensitize the world through this experiment and have a war policy, or at least initially the Indian policy, and have a legislature to say, well, 25% of the parklands in India, or you know, as a whole, should be converted to the river plantation. Uh, so, we can have a very river plantation, and it's only better. So this is the climate buyback you can see in another world which provides particular bioengineering. It can be a national policy or can be a global policy. And how do we do this policy advocacy? I would like to show you.